Hey guys, this is Shell, your Rolling MC, and I am the mouth on the mic of Hitting the Streets podcast show. Tonight, I have Aaron Busey. Is that correct? Did I say that name right? Am I close? Close. Okay, how do you say it? Busey. Busey. And he is the owner of Private Eye Coffee. Please, sir, introduce yourself. Well, I'm Aaron Busey. Thank you for that. <laughs> Make sure I get that right. So, uh... I live here in Sherman. I'm not sure how big the audience is, but we're in Sherman, Texas. Sure. So we're local. We've been here this time for about 15 years, my wife and I and, and uh, my daughter. And we have uh, we've got a beauty group of companies in downtown. <laughs> and so we do lots of legal services and things like that. And uh, uh, some investigations. We have our investigations. So we've got all kinds of stuff going on in, in uh, downtown Sherman and just around and, and we're involved in a few outside nonprofit type oh, activities, and so sure. we're just we're here. We're Sherman Sherman residents doing the Sherman thing. So I heard you say that you have some other um, entities now, guys. When I first met Aaron, I was like, "Why Private Eye?" So tell us, how did you come up with this name? Well, uh, when we first looked at getting into coffee business, mm -hmm. uh, we were about well. For me, I was. Uh, on my eighth year of private investigating. So I started off in law enforcement in 2010 and started doing uh, private investigations uh, a little bit, kind of as a side job really mm -hmm. in the beginning. And, and over the course of the first two or three years of doing it as a side job, it actually became pretty lucrative. And so I've been exclusively doing it now for about seven years. Wow, and wow. So, so when we were looking at, hey coffee, everybody's got coffee, right? <laughs> and then everybody so, loves some coffee. <laughs> so. We didn't want it to be too gimmicky, Ooh. particularly, but we still okay. wanted it to be something that was uh, important to us. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Private Eye Coffee just seemed it seemed catchy. It seemed short and sweet, and uh, so we went with it. And then once we actually got our logo developed, we love the logo. Everybody loves the and, logo. And the logo was what I noticed the most about mm -hmm. it. It's a huge logo, guys, and it has this guy on there. Looks like a Private Eye with a <laughs> raincoat on and the hat. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah, it's more of the uh, noir type. Yes, yeah. Silhouette. But uh, when we saw the logo, we knew we had to stick with it. And so it just, it was who we were, and we just kind of kept everything in that theme. Sure. Yeah. I just want to tell everybody, too, because I was so attracted to the big logo, of course I had to ask and find out if he could do my logo the same way. <laughs> so when you guys are watching the video on YouTube and you look at the back of the wall, yes, thanks, Aaron. <laughs> He's the one that did my logo that's here in the studio. So, yeah, I think it's pretty cool. It didn't take him no time to get it up with a nice light glow in the back. <laughs> I'm proud of that logo. Good. Yeah, it looks great on the wall. It, it looks even better on the wall than it did on the on the cutting table. <laughs> I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. So I was going to ask you, you know, like who inspired you, influenced you, but what drawn you into being an entrepreneur? So my first kind of foray into, you know, quote unquote entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. um, I mean, being a private investigator is a self-employed job, but the actual entrepreneurship I consider would be, uh, we started publishing books, uh, oh, like yes. an independent mm -hmm. label type publisher. Mm -hmm. publishing house and we did that and I say we my wife and I mm -hmm. kind of, we did that in the house mm -hmm. and the reason we came up and started doing books is one uh, I had some ideas that I was kicking around but two when we were thinking how can we uh, develop a business that has a product that we can renew so we need a product that doesn't cost us a lot of money that we can sell and so when you start looking around at any wholesale stuff or what other people are doing there's not a lot of money to be made off the things that are out there. So if you're buying wholesale somewhere else, uh, you might get 20% profit. Uh -huh, right. But when you're talking about items that are five to twenty dollars, 20%, 20 you got to put a lot of volume. <laughs> That's all right, exactly. And, uh, at the time, I didn't really feel like we were experts in anything in particular that we could hey throw this together and say it's worth thousands of dollars and, and you know make a big profit. So it was going to have to be something that we could move a lot of units up and. Uh, I just discovered the, the book process and got interested in it, learned how to actually go through the entire formatting and publishing setup process and how to do it. Copywriting so, and all that. Copywriting and everything, yeah. yeah. And um, so with that, that's a resource that uh, doesn't cost us, whether it's somebody else bringing a manuscript or whether it was a manuscript, say, that we had 
that we wrote, which we haven't written <laughs> manuscripts, but um, so the cost of putting that together is really low. And then the amount of units you can sell really is unlimited. It's all up to the author that wrote it, how much they want to promote that product. So let me make sure really quick. So you created a business pretty much to help people put their books out there. Is that what you're saying? No, I, am, am I understanding? Yeah, ultimately that? that's what I mean, and, and I know you have a book too, mm -hmm. correct? I do. Okay, yeah. well, tell so, me just a little bit, finish up and then tell us what your book is about afterwards. Okay, sure. Yeah, so what we discovered, and the reason I started looking at books is because I had uh, the idea that I, of the book that I wanted to, to put together. Mm -hmm. and, and looking at the costs and looking at the process and what people are going through in trying to get something published. Not everybody has the deal that Stephen King has, right? Where you can just <laughs> turn in any manuscript that you feel good about. It's going to get published. You've yeah. got to channel, wait months, spend lots of money. And if it's not one of the cream of the crop uh, manuscripts that gets published in the first year and you got to wait a long time, well, then people find themselves in what's called vanity publishing and it costs quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the statistics that I saw is that. Um, Almost 80% of the population has something that they either want to publish, it's an idea in their mind, they have something that they've actually created and it's just sitting on their closet shelf somewhere because right. they don't know what step two is, um, or uh, they've actually gone through the process of trying to get published and just haven't either been accepted by a place that's going to do it for free mm. and whatnot. So 80% of our population is a lot of potential customers. <laughs> and so. Uh, I started doing an experiment with it, it. So I had some friends that were going to Grayson College at the time, and I said, Hey, try this. I said, Just anytime you see somebody in the hallway or you're passing, and it's, it's a quick conversation, just out of the blue, cold call, ask them, Hey, have you ever thought about publishing anything? Mm -hmm. And you know, it was 100%. Every single person that we asked, probably really? 20 people, probably said that 20 they. People. They wanted to publish something. Yeah. They either had poems, or they had uh, short stories, or they had uh, illustrations. So many people want to do it, and That's so many people don't know what to do after they make their creation. And so, what we found in the self-publishing world is that, it, in my opinion, it really seemed like the self-publishers were taking advantage of that. The cost that mm -hmm. they were charging. Now that I've learned what mm -hmm. the steps were and how to do it, and then yeah. seeing the cost that they were charging, I thought it was just absolutely ridiculous. ridiculous and really prohibitive on a lot of people to get their content out there. And so we put together a price structure that would make it worth our while to do what we could do, and then um, the creator, author, could actually start making some money within just a couple of weeks versus a few years. Uh, a quick example of that is uh, one of our customers had published through the, the traditional self-publishing channels, and it took him three years to break even. I was going to say, that takes three to five years to even get that up and going. Because it's a yeah. business. I mean, you're, you're yeah. putting your book out there is like running a business. Well, the biggest problem with that is with the self-publishers. So they had a, an ordering framework. Now, as the author, you're the one that created the content. You mm -hmm. wrote it. Right. You laid it out. You edited it. Right. Okay. So to get it published, they were charging about $1,500 just to put the thing together for you. So now you've got to put together, but then you have to order books because if you're going to sell them, you have to have them to sell them. And so as the author, they would have to order 150 copies or more oh my. at a time to get a discount. Otherwise, the author had to pay the retail price. So you'd never make any money. Oh my god! So, I did not know any of this! So even ordering 150 books at a time, they'd get 30% off the retail. So if your book is $15, you order it, you're still paying $12 a copy for it. So how much do you have to sell it for? To make a little bit. And on top of that, they would charge shipping. So if you have 150 books, oh my gosh. that's some heavy shipping. Yeah. So, so between the ordering cost, the setup cost, and the shipping cost, uh, you know, they're only making about $3 a book at that point. And so uh, most people will be in about $3,000 out of pocket up front, and it took three oh. years. And that's three years of hustling every weekend at events mm -hmm. and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so the process we were able to put together, we could provide exactly the same thing. The books were for sale through Amazon and uh, BarnesandNoble.com mm -hmm. and, and Hastings at the time still in existence. Oh, Hastings. And so we had all the same outlets mm -hmm. and um, same quality products, really, and sometimes better, I think. Mm -hmm. And we were able to do it in a, in a price structure where we did it a per unit cost that included shipping and taxes and everything, and there was no minimums. And so if you had a book that you wanted to write, we put it mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. we'd say your cost, hey, uh, you know, we'd figure what our cost was to produce it and the shipping rates and stuff. And I'd say, okay, Shell, well, uh, your book, if you want it, if you want one, it's going to be six dollars for you. If you want ten, it'd be sixty dollars, etc., etc. It's always a six 
you know, a specific mm -hmm. per unit price. And doing it that way, this person that took three years to break even on his first book, we did his second book, and he made money in three weeks. And he wow. was selling stuff on weekends because wow. the out-of-pocket cost was minimized so much that it made it worthwhile for him. Wow. And so we did that. We published, I don't know exactly the number, but somewhere between 25 and 30 titles that we've done. Wow. I'm going to have to follow up with you offline on that. That's <laughs> interesting. Tell us a little bit about your book. Now, you have written a book and published it. Tell us a little bit about that. So my book came out in October of 2016, so just over five years ago. It's called Full Report, The Memoirs of a Rural Texas Peace Officer. And the entire book is true stories of my experiences um, of being a rural police officer, a peace officer in rural Texas. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I, I learned uh, in law enforcement was that the experience that I had as, a, as an officer in low population cities and low population counties is completely different from the experience that an officer has in a city of 30,000 or a million or anywhere. Um, the experience that a game warden has is going to be different than either of those. The experience that a high patrolman has is going to be different. And they're all, you know, everyone's lumped together as law enforcement, but really when you start talking to people in different roles of law enforcement, you realize really fast that people are seeing a lot different things depending on which specific position they hold. Yeah. Um, but uh, so in the title, it's specifically the memoirs of a rural Texas peace officer because there's really a plan in place to do it of, of uh, Texas game wardens and do a book of you know, stories of Texas Highway Patrol, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, and different, uh, different niches of law enforcement. But in my book, uh, The uh, Memoirs of a Rural Texas Peace Officer, it covers the first five years of time that I was out on the street. And it's not about any particular specific topic, just things that were memorable or funny or Your experience. notable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just things. And what spurred that on was, uh, you know, people would say, oh, what do you do for a living? Oh, you're a cop. Oh, the first thing out of their mouth is, I bet you've seen some crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And I found First thing out of my mouth, I was like, oh, well, okay, <laughs> have a good day. You're right. <laughs> Yep, didn't even have to you know, read your rights. Yeah, no, did not. Right. I gotta go. <laughs> so, um, I found myself telling the same stories a lot. Um, oh, so, yeah. You know, the, of course, the ones that were memorable to me were the sure. ones that I would tell people when they were at. And so, since I was realizing that I was telling the same set of stories over and over and over, I thought maybe I can make a book out of it. Yeah. And so, I spent uh, about a year and a half uh, putting it together editing it, um, getting the layout and the, kind of the, mm -hmm. the order of the stories to, mm -hmm. to go with the flow, mm -hmm. design the cover. And, you know, did you really? Yeah, I did do, do that cover. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of elements that go into mm -hmm. just the book, the, sure. the, the layout. Um, so we had about 20 people proof it, go through it, edit. And the goal was to have it so that it was enjoyable for anybody. You didn't have to have a legal background or a law enforcement background yeah. or anything. It could be mm -hmm. stories that uh, if you're just sitting around the fireplace at Thanksgiving and I was telling that story, anybody could yes. enjoy it. Yes, 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 yes. So where can we find this book? So it's available on Amazon. It's available on, last time I checked, walmart.com, barnesandnoble.com. Well, look at so you, it's man. in pretty much any book retailer okay. online. Uh, physical copies um, used to be at Hastings. But I know. <laughs> without Hastings, the, the memories. I takes. know. You said yeah. Hastings, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. So, but okay. you get physical copies at Private Eye Coffee Shop. Yes. Shop. Okay. So yeah. Downtown Sherman. Well, I want to ask you really quick. As far as the coffee shop, what has been your most satisfying moment or satisfying moment? Uh, with the coffee shop specifically, I'd say um, just the amount of people that have come in and said. You know, we saw that it was under construction for six months. We're so excited for it. Okay, guys, we are <laughs> back. And I'm back with Aaron. Right here. Aaron <laughs> with Private Eye. And we're going to wrap up really quick. So I know we have several coffee shops that are here in our area. So what makes your coffee shop unique? Well, we actually roast our own coffee beans. So we roast them right here in Sherman. Mm -hmm. uh, we get them green. Come from... Uh, Guatemala, when we get them, they're still in the, the burlap bag from Guatemala. Wow, I didn't know that. Presumably from the coffee farm. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we get them, bags come 152 pounds at a time, and we roast four pounds at a time, so small batch roasting. 
And so uh, the coffee that we serve generally is less than 14 days old when you're drinking it. So it's super fresh. Got a great aroma. It's, it's I was going to so say, good. I remember smelling it that one time I walked in. I was like, wow. Yeah, so I think that's probably the biggest difference is that it's, it is fresh, fresh roasted. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I know there's a couple other shops that are roasting their own coffee mm -hmm. and stuff. I don't know what's batch sizes and stuff, but everybody's roast palettes are different. Mm -hmm. So we have our own unique flavor. Um, and the atmosphere in our place is, uh, I think, super relaxed. It's kind of set up where you can grab and go or yeah. come hang out, mm -hmm. whichever. It can really uh, accommodate both of those situations. And the decor with a bunch of private investigators on the wall. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know how you can beat that. Right. Uh, we'll show some old, uh, you, you know, old shows like Murder, She Wrote. Things yeah. That are, things that are in, in tune with that theme. And so it's just a nice place. It's fun. We've got nice things and molds in there. And it just the atmosphere. When we finished and opened the doors, it was exactly what I had envisioned when we started the build out on it. Only more comfortable than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it turned out great. So I'm really excited about it. So, um, if you had any advice to give someone that wanted to start off with a coffee shop or wanted to be an entre entrepreneur, what advice would you give them? Uh, just keep moving forward. The, the biggest thing is to get up every day and go do something. Mm -hmm. You may not ultimately accomplish anything, but the more you're out and about trying to get things done, you run into people, opportunities come up that really most of them are unexpected when they do come up. And um, just getting out there, keep moving forward every day. You're going to get discouraged, uh, but just keep trying solutions. There's always a solution. Oh, there. Exactly. Always exactly. a solution. And there's enough people locally that if you really can't figure out the solution on your own, don't be afraid to reach out to somebody. Even yeah. if it's somebody you've never talked to, just say, hey, you know, I got your number from such and such, yeah. or I knew you were involved with this. Would you mind kind of yeah. pointing me in the right direction? And I found that people are, are pretty receptive to that. And, uh, you know, one of the things... I've recently been appointed to the, the Main Street Advisor. Yeah, yeah, good, congratulations. Uh, thank you. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I'd really like to do is get a type of mentor program set up. Oh, that's a great idea. small business development yes. downtown. Because there is, uh, doing the coffee shop was a brand new venture that I had no idea what we were doing. Mm -hmm. I was calling the city every day just going to make sure that we were doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what permits necessarily we had to have. I didn't know who we called for this and that. And so we just kind of stumbled through it really. And um, I think it would be super beneficial to have somebody Ooh, guide right. a new person through and be able to kind of get them in contact with the right laborers and mm -hmm. the right, you know. And I think you'd be excellent for the job. <laughs> 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 okay, so tell us really quick what events you have and give us your social media information so we can start following you. Okay, well, social media is pretty simple. It's Private Eye Coffee Company, uh, maybe in the Private Eye Coffee shortened form without the word company, but it's on Facebook. Um, it is on Instagram, temporarily not, but okay. it is there. Okay. I'm having a, a little hacking issue. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, and we do have uh, a YouTube page for the Private Eye Coffee Company. There's not much there, but we plan to, to start getting it going, especially now that the brick and mortar is open. Yeah. Um, what was the first part of that question? You're, uh, if you have any events coming oh, events. Up. Uh, we don't have anything scheduled at the moment, but do check out the social media, especially on the Facebook, because we do have plans. We've had a food truck. Uh, food trucks yeah. in the past come out. Trivia they, night. They, yeah, you made it up for that. And trivia nights. And we are currently, as we speak, working on uh, a menu to have over there to have not full meals, so to speak, but mm -hmm. we're going to have dinner salads and we're going to have some sandwiches mm -hmm. and we're going to have some other snacks. And, stuff, and, snacks <laughs> and, and breakfast and stuff. Yeah. And so uh, we're kind of expanding that. And as that gets expanded, we'll be able to move our hours a little bit where um, it should generate a little more revenue in the evenings to keep us in that. Uh, 7 to 8 p.m. window during the week. So okay. we'll be open a little bit later. Okay, guys. You heard it. Well, thank you so much, Aaron, for being on the show. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. It's awesome. All right, guys. This is Shelly Rolling MC, and I am out of here.